Well, good evening. Good to have you with us, as well as those over at our uh, Stevens Point campus that are watching live right now. So weird noises going on in here. Uh, and those who are watching all over the uh, world on the internet. Glad that you've joined with us for our Ash Wednesday service. Let me give you a little setup for what you're going to experience with us tonight. Uh, Celebration Church is uh, a little different in, in many ways, <laughs> but the, one of the things that kind of sets us apart, we're different in this sense. Most, most churches tend to either be holy, an evangelical church, or a charismatic church, or a traditional liturgical church, and they stay within those borders and they try not to cross into the other streams, if, as, as you will. Celebration Church is different. We're more of, the word would be a convergent church in this sense, that what we do is we have taken what we believe is the best, hello, the best of all worlds, okay? So we have taken both the uh, evangelical, the charismatic, and the liturgical uh, streams and mixed them together. It's what makes us different uh, as, as a congregation. Well, tonight we're uh, kicking off the season of Lent, which most uh, evangelical churches and charismatic churches don't recognize at all. They just don't do it. They're aware of it. They just don't do it for whatever reasons. Uh, we look at it and we think this is one of the good things. So we, we've gone into all the different ones and we've tried to pull out the elements that we think, you know, these are very meaningful things. These are powerful things, be it evangelical, charismatic, or liturgical, and honor them and respect them and incorporate them into our lives. So tonight, uh, Lent kicks off with, with what we call Ash Wednesday, which is in <laughs> the most morbid of senses, a celebration of dying, <laughs> or, or maybe not so much a celebration, or kind of more of a reminder that we are mortal. Uh, from dust we came and to dust we shall return. Uh, the scriptures encourage us to number our days. You know, uh, it's, it's kind of an odd service, but it's, it's a great service in that sometimes we need, just need to stop and, and remind ourselves, hey, we're all just passing through this place. And nobody knows what time they have, but what, the time that we have, we need to honor God and do not act as though we shall live for eternity on this earth, for we shall not, none of us shall. So it's a great reflective service uh, thinking about this time. And the tradition of Ash Wednesday actually goes way back. It started, we'll hear a little bit about this uh, coming up in the service, but uh, in the second century, which is like 200 years, uh, the first 200 years of Christianity, to put it in perspective, Christmas was not celebrated uh, in churches for another 400 years. They didn't even celebrate or acknowledge Christmas until the sixth century. So this goes way back even before that. This is one of the oldest, and this is uh, uh, before there was any Roman Catholic Church or Eastern Orthodox. And this is a really old service that they uh, used, they incorporated this. The early Christian fathers said, we should do this as a reflection. So when we do this tonight, we are connecting with those saints of centuries ago that uh, stop to think, you know, we're just passing through this place. All right, let's all stand together and we'll open in a word of prayer and we will begin our service. Now this is a much more, this is probably our most liturgical service of the year. It's not full on liturgical. No one's wearing robes and no processions and incense, which I, can, I love the smell of that stuff. Uh, but, uh, so, but, but it's more liturgical. It'll be much more structured uh, as, as we go through it. There'll be a time of prayer and response where you'll respond as I'm leading in prayer and uh, things that are done more in a liturgical thing. So you're going to see some of those strains uh, because we are now reflecting on a service that has been going along for about 1,800 years. Very long time. Well, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that we can gather tonight to reflect on the fact that, in fact, we are but dust. Uh, during when the fall of man, uh, God reminded uh, Adam that, hey, you guys came from dust. You're going to go back to dust because of, because of the fallenness of our, of our sin and, and nature and our human being. Lord, tonight as we do this, we want to just commit ourselves to you as we launch into this season of Lent, kicking it off with this service. For your glory, we pray. May it be meaningful and impactful in all of our hearts that gather here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> a 
Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. <coughs> so we were at lunch today. My father said he wanted to start up and kind of do an intro and set up the service. I said, really? Because that's what was scripted out for me. He's like, no, no, I'll do my intro and then you can do your thing. I just don't think you knew what my thing was. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to skip forward. Is that okay, Bishop? Yeah. I'm the, okay. <laughs> I was like, wait. Oh, all right. I could have said it again. But one of the things um, that, yes, as you heard, this is a slightly different service. You know, uh, you're going to see a little bit more, you know, symbolism. And sometimes symbolism is something we don't necessarily like because we tend to be a little more <laughs> analytical about the way that we think and te technological. Um, but it's okay to be symbolic and have symbolism. You know, we use it every day in our lives, right? Every time you see someone, what do you do? You wave. That's a symbol. Or you, you, you meet a friend you haven't seen for a while, you give them a hug. That's a symbol of your friendship. And that's really what's going on tonight, is there's some symbolism going on. And um, just to kind of explain to you how the service is going to run, uh, we are going to do four different movements. All right, in movement one, we're going to focus on the fact that human beings are created, and we are creatures. Movement two will focus on our need to turn away from our own way of doing things to God's way of doing things. We call this repentance. And movement three will be a time to pause and remember our own mortality. The fact is that one day, if you live long enough, you will die. <laughs> and we need to understand that life is a gift, but it does come with an expiration date. Movement four will come time for the table of the Lord, or as we call it here, a time for communion. And movement three, that is where, that's going to be the part where we uh, have some of the ashes uh, put on the forehead. And the way that we get those ashes is they're made from the palm branches uh, from Palm Sunday last year. And they will be pretty obvious. It's going to be right on there. Um, if it really freaks you out, there's no obligation to have to do this. Um, but just to kind of understand what it's going to look like. And you may say, well, well why, why the ashes? Well, because if you recall, ashes were used in both the Old and New Testaments, as well as throughout church history, to symbolize deep spiritual surrender and dependency upon God. In the book of Esther, Mordecai put ashes on his head when he heard of the decree of the king to kill all of the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. The ashes were a mark of his desperation for God to move in the situation. Daniel put ashes on his head to intercede for Israel's release from Babylon. They were in what seemed like unending captivity. Ashes were used to declare a dependency on God and a refusal to rely on human strength to fix things of what was wrong in life. And also, Ash Wednesday, it marks the beginning of a 40-day period, which is often called Lent. And this 40-day season was engaged in by the early Christians, as you heard some 1,800 years ago. And it was as a preparation for the celebration of resurrection, the triumph of Jesus over death. They knew the resurrection had happened, but they also knew its implications had not been fully completed. And they would not be until Christ returned. So Lent calls each of us to renew our ongoing commitment to the implications of the resurrection in our own lives, here and now. Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19. And God said to the man, Because you followed your wife's advice instead of my command and ate from the tree, from which I have forbidden you to eat, cursed is the ground. For the rest of your life you will fight for every crumb of food from the crusty clump of clay I made you from. As you labor, the ground will produce thorns and thistles, and you will eat the plants of the field. 
Your brow will sweat for you to taste, for your mouth to taste even a morsel of bread until the day you return to the very ground I made you from. From dust you have come, and to dust you shall return. Praise Him above the heavenly 
Holy Ghost. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You know, when we have an encounter in our lives with the divine or with the holy, it creates this very unique, um, almost feeling of dependence. And the scriptures do record it, actually. In Genesis, when Abraham speaks in the presence of God, he's recorded as saying this, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, And then we read in the book of Isaiah that when he was in the face of the holy, he said this, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And in the New Testament, we see it recorded from Peter when he saw Jesus, and he fell to his knees, and he cried out, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. You know, it is in these kinds of moments that we experience something that that is sometimes called, um, it's kind of a a big phrase, creature consciousness. I tried to say that a few times fast. (laughs) At any rate, it's in that moment when we just become keenly aware of truly how we are just a creature. We have all the emotions of a creature but we stand in an overwhelming place in contrast to God, the almighty, holy God, who is not creature at all, but rather he is the creator. You notice this moment for many that they actually come into a moment of salvation in their recognition of, of their nothingness compared to an almighty God. But for some, we experience those moments also in times of prayer or worship. I would challenge you tonight, if that's a moment that you haven't experienced yet, if you haven't really crossed that threshold into faith yet, that maybe you've been coming to church and going through the motions, but if you haven't had that moment yet, I want you to know that tonight's service could be a game changer for you. If you will press in, if you will allow yourselves to hear and experience and embrace the things that are shared this evening. Tonight could be that defining night for you. You know, we enter into this season with the intention to remember that we really are simply creatures before the one who is not creature but creator. And we stop and we pause and we just hope to be fascinated and maybe in awe of the triune God. So these ashes tonight they really do represent what we would be if the Creator stopped holding us. We would truly just crumble into simple dust. I would ask you if you would be willing to pray with me. We're going to just say a simple prayer all together to acknowledge our dependence on our Creator God. Please say this with me. Oh Lord, my God, Teach my heart this day where and how to see you, where and how to find you. You have made me and remade me. You are creator and I am creature. All the good things I possess have come from you. And yet, I do not know you well. Teach me to seek you, for I cannot seek you unless you teach me or find you unless you show yourself to me. I pray as the psalmist prayed, apart from you, I want nothing on earth. My body and my heart faint for joy. God is my possession forever. Let me seek you in my desire. Let me desire you in my seeking. Let me find you by loving you. Let me love you when I find you. Amen.
In a little bit, Bishop Ed will be coming and leading us uh, in the ceremony of the uh, putting on of ashes. And then uh, uh, Bishop uh, Sean Yost is going to be leading us as we conclude with communion. Sean is from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, <laughs> he got in here last night and, uh, and he came out and he just looked stunned. He says, there's snow. He says, I looked at the forecast. They said there was no snow. I said, no, that means there's not going to be any snowing. <laughs> Once it snows, it stays here unless it gets hot enough to melt it away. So uh, he's still in culture shock, but pray for him. As, uh, <laughs> he's, he says, it's, it's so cold. How do, you know, how, people always say, how do you live in the cold? People from the South say, well, we don't live in it. We run from a warm house into a warm car. And so I said, you'll be fine. Just run and minimize the experience. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, we read the words of John the Baptist. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, preparing the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's words were prepare the way, make straight his path. Uh, John is simply saying we should make room for God in our lives, clear out some things. This is at, what is at the heart of the concept of repentance. Repentance is about refusing to live in alienation from God. God is life, and turning away from him is anti-life. So this big begs the question, what direction is your life moving? At any given moment, we're either moving forward towards God as a pilgrim, or we're moving away from him as a prodigal. In order to determine which direction your life is going, you need to take a spiritual inventory. We need to ask ourselves, what's going on in my soul? Paul the Apostle uh, encouraged us in, uh, we read his words in 2 Corinthians, which actually is 3 Corinthians. <laughs> Uh, first and Second Corinthians. There was one before that. We don't know where it is, so we just call them First and Second Corinthians. But Paul talks about it in First Corinthians. A little trivia there, in case you're on Jeopardy someday. <clears throat> Examine yourselves, he said, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. This is what I'm supposed to do as Christians: reflect, look inward. This comes from the rich spiritual tradition uh, in Jewish thought that we read in the Psalms, where the psalmist writes, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So it's a type of spiritual checkup, and spiritual checkups are a good thing. John the Baptist was a huge spiritual checkup guy. He came to encourage people to check their hearts, to see if they were being pilgrims moving toward God or prodigals moving away from him. The good news is that God is always near us at whatever state you're in. Uh, that's why John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. You know, that's kind of an odd thing because oftentimes when you are failing and we're going away from God, we feel that God is a million miles away from us. That somehow we have to work our way back, you know, in order to reconnect with God. And that's not true. No matter what your state is tonight, baby, you're here. Uh, visiting in church, you haven't been in church for a long time and you've been away from God and you think God's so far away from me. No, you can turn right now, turn to God and he is near. So the ashes we wear tonight symbolize the process of turning to God as a pilgrim. The prophet Jeremiah pleaded for the Israelites to repent by saying to them, oh my people, put on, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. And when we do this, there's an immediate sense of freshness. As Phil mentioned, Ash Wednesdays, is the traditional kickoff of Lent. We talked about that, okay? Now the word Lent literally means spring. <laughs> Believe it or not, most of the world experiences spring. <laughs> if you're a Wisconsinite and you've never really left much of Wisconsin, you have no idea. We are being robbed for the next two months <laughs> because you know we have summer, we have fall, we have winter, and, and then we have winter and eventually transition to mud, and then eventually summer comes back. But there's actually places around the country, most of the country, where it actually gets warm again, and flowers are popping out, and there's this fresh renewal. You know, it could still look like it this on Easter. Anyway, we'll see. 
But spring is a time when the earth exits the deadness of winter. <laughs> Most of them sooner than us, but they will exit. We, even we will eventually exit this deadness of winter, and we enter the freshness of spring. Everybody loves spring, right? This is the reason that Lent is here, and it's supposed to symbolize the sense of spring. It's a time to flee the coldness or winter of our hearts. Okay, another way to say to repent in order to zealously enter a springtime of faith, the pilgrimage into hope. Its origins have to do with examining the heart and finding ways to make room for God in the human heart. This is the why of traditional fasting during the 40 days of Lent, the Lenten period uh, leading up to Resurrection Sunday. Now, if you do the math, you'll find out that it's actually more than 40 days. What's the difference? Is they don't count Sundays, uh, which is more of an orthodox thing. Um, where, uh, and a lot of people don't know this. During Lent, people will traditionally give up something. You know, it could be something minor, but the thing is you give it up, and then you miss it, right? And it kind of creates a hole in you. The good news is that in the actual traditional uh, orthodox version of Lent, you get Sundays off. I don't know if you knew that. We've been holding out on you. But, uh, so if you're giving up chocolate, you can take a bath in chocolate on Sunday. All right? And, and then back into it again, although it might make your next five days, six days, much more miserable if you go crazy. But uh, that's it. So Sunday's always a resurrection day. They take the break and then back into the days of Lent. Uh, and by giving things that we create this sense of a whole, something that's meaningful to you, and it's to, to, different, other, to different people. Some people are giving up their iPods. <laughs> For, uh, for Lent, some are giving up, uh, you know, chocolate, as, as I examined. But it's usually something that you miss. For example, I uh, have no problem giving up coffee because I, I don't drink coffee. So it doesn't mean anything to me. Some of you will go through horrible withdrawals for the next uh, few weeks, if that's what you choose to do, if you are a coffee drinker. But what does it do? It, it, you sense this missing. And it can be the littlest things. I'm telling you, sometimes the craziest little thing, and it, it doesn't really matter. Whatever is significant for you to put you in a place of faith, you know, I remember once giving up something like a Snickers bar. Well, how hard can that be? And all day long, everywhere you look, you see ads for Snickers bars. And you see people eating Snickers. And you can smell Snickers everywhere. And it's amazing when you say no to one thing, all of a sudden, ooh, there it is. And it creates this kind of hole in you, which is the point. Because what we're asking God is every time you sense the missing of that thing that you are saying no to, you ask God to fill the hole, that you turn towards him during this empty space. Okay? Now, historically in Lent, believers were urged to participate in preparing themselves for a new freshness, a new openness um, uh, to the power of the resurrection that is going to be celebrated at Easter to make room for God. Kind of a spring cleaning. Actually, the notion of spring cleaning, we all know spring cleanings, right? Everybody talks about spring cleanings. It actually came from Lent and the season of Lent. That's where the concept came from. Okay? So our ashes tonight declare our movement from sin to a renewed pilgrimage towards God, from wasting our lives to living in pursuit in the face of God. And this is where life and happiness actually exists. The intent of the season is to stretch us to be more open to both the healing of our souls and the pur purging of things that distract us from that. Uh, we are here to renew a, a personal faith that maybe has grown dull. We examine our lives and instead of just assuming we're okay, so that's the thing, we go along. The Bible actually warns us of uh, deceiving ourselves. I've challenged people with this. They often say, oh, I don't feel deceived, but that's the point. <laughs> you're deceived. When you're deceived, you don't know that you're deceived, hence the effectiveness of deception. Uh, so it's good to stop and not just assume everything's okay. Just stop and say, okay, wait, wait a minute. Because most people, you know, we always say, how you doing? Oh, I'm great, even though half the time you're lying. Uh, but to stop and say, okay, where am I at? It's that pause that we're going to get into. We slow to look at what's really going on in here. Uh, this season confronts us with what we have become and prods us to do better. We are nudged to open our hearts to the word of God in the hope that this time, hearing it anew, we might allow ourselves to become new as a result of hearing God's word. It's a call to prayer and a call for us to rise to the full stature of being in the image of God. Uh, actually, it is a call to prayer, and uh, throughout the season of Lent, Every Monday morning at 6 a.m., for those of you who can drag yourselves away, we will be gathering at the church to pray at our, on our uh, uh, campus in Stevens Point or wherever you're at. And even if you can't make it, maybe just make a special time of prayer 
even if you're at home. Uh, so Monday mornings, it's going to be this time where we're going to uh, have a call to prayer. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. So anyway, this is what we're going to do. Now what I'd like to do is have you all stand. And I'm going to, this is a time where we're going to kind of do a, a call and response, okay? So I'm going to pray something and then you are going to respond. It should be up on the screen so you know what to say. We don't normally do this, so hopefully we don't mess it up. Here we go. Lord, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and we have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Too often we have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ, and we have grieved your Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, our pride, our hypocrisy, and the impatience of our lives. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways in our exploitation of other people. Our anger and our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. Our intemperate uh, love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty sometimes in the daily life and work. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to bear witness to others the faith that is in us. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, for our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Restore us, O Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord. Now just take a few minutes and uh, bow your, your heads and just reflect. In your own words, whisper to God and ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and lives and maybe show us the kinds of things that we need to turn away from. Amen. You may be seated.
The ashes symbolize our mortality. Abraham, who is called the father of faith, declared, I am nothing but dust and ashes when he came to entreat the Lord in prayer. As we have already seen tonight, we were created from dust. The Genesis narrative says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And we return to them, Genesis 3 says, For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Throughout the ancient world, the saints who were about to die would be laid on the ground on top of sackcloth that was sprinkled with ashes. This was an acceptance of God's perspective on the human condition. There are very few things that are certain in this world. One of them is each one of our lives will end in death. It would be odd to think about this too much, right? But we must think about it once in a while. You and I are going to die. Some of us refuse to ever think about it. And in ways we pretend like it isn't true. But before we can speak of death, it's good to remember that our lives were started by the author of life. We were created when our bodies were formed in our mother. The Old Testament and New Testament agree that God is the father of human spirits, referring to the creation of each individual and unique human being. The psalmist declared in Psalm 139, for you created my inmost being. Is something wrong? Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to be a professional. <laughs> yes, thank you. We are talking about sin and death. <laughs> the psalmist said in Psalm 139, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made or created. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. In Acts 17, in the New Testament, Paul claims to the pagans that every human being was pre-planned in terms of time and place. And it's clear from the Bible that human beings are not accidents, that we are dreams of God come true. The biblical claim is that God is still creating. Every new life coming into this world is a result of God's action in this world. And here's the kicker. This is only part one of our journey. Life here. Paul writes, what eye has not seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived are the things God has prepared for the people who love him. In thinking of a world that is to come, Paul mused in Philippians 1, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, there is more for us than this. There is more for us than what we experience here. Death is simply a transition for the believer, not an end of the believer. C.S. Lewis captured the concept of crossing into eternity on the last page of his series of the Chronicles of Narnia. He closes this series by writing, quote, for us, this is the end of all the stories. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world had only been the cover and the title page. Now the last, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great 
story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and in which every chapter is better than the one before, end quote. This is why the, the Bible claims that death is not to be feared by believers. The Hebrews text says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death, that we might be free from its fear. Talking of death is not done to creep us out, though it's kind of creepy. It's done to help us remember our mortality, the fact that we will die. Why? Because thinking of that fosters wisdom. Psalm 90 said, and Mark allude, or spoke of it, teach us, the psalmist writes, to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There's something about keeping it in your mind that makes you wise. Thinking about our mortality is only morbid when you think about it shallowly. But if you ponder on it rightly, there are some things that will emerge that are weighted with wisdom. It helps us to remember that this is only part one of our existence. It helps us to remember that we will face God one day, not just believe in him. And that we are accountable for what we do with our lives. The Romans text says, so then each of us will give an account of himself or herself to God. This can help us live more intentionally in this moment. That remembering our mortality helps us to keep in mind the transient nature of life, and it causes us to love others more, those that are with us on the journey more, not less. And then it also helps us examine what is most important in this life that's transient, which can lead to a recalibration of priorities. This is all at the heart of wisdom, the wisdom that thinking of these things enables. As uncomfortable as it may be for us, we need to face the fact that we are all going to die. Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. But then the wind blows over it. Life blows over it. And it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. In just a moment, we're going to come forward to place these ashes on our forehead. Let's remember that we are creatures. Let's remember that we're to turn from being prodigal, like the prodigal son. Prodigality means wastefulness. And let us remember to turn to becoming pilgrims, those that are on a journey to another place, representing that other place. And then finally, let's remember that we are going to move beyond this world and beyond this life that we are going to die. But this can be faced without fear and with hope in view to the world which is to come. As the creed ends, that we believe in the life that is to come. But in death, we're safe in God's hand until the resurrection of the dead where we will rise with new, undying bodies to participate in whatever God is dreaming the future to be. This is the story that gives shape to our lives. So let's stand. As we prepare to receive the imposition of ashes, I will first impose ashes on the pastors who will be doing the same for you, and then they'll take their stations in the front, Whoever's in front of you, you can come out and come around. And uh, they'll mark ashes on your forehead with the sign of the cross, saying to you, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And that mark, in a way it's humiliating, but it's a call for us 
to be captured by the story of the human experience and God's love. But first, let's pray this prayer together, if you would, together with me. Campuses, join us. Gracious God, you created us out of the dust of the earth and breathed into us the breath of life. By your hand we live, and to your hands we return when all our days are gone. Grant that the awareness of our mortality may lead us not to fear, but to faith. In our weakness, teach us to look to you for strength. In our failures, to turn to you and find forgiveness. And in our dying, to await the gift of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, Amen.
wonder if I'll ever find my way I wonder if my life could really change All this earth Could all that is lost ever be found? Could a garden come up from this ground at all? You make beautiful things You make beautiful things Out of the dust You make beautiful things You make beautiful things Out of us
Amen. You could be seated. I'm going to ask the communion ushers to go ahead and get in place. I see you guys are already there. Thank you. And you can go ahead and begin distributing those. But as they do, I want to ask you to go ahead and just hold them as you get those elements. Go ahead and distribute the communion elements now. And once you have them, just hold on to them. And we're going to do something right now that's so significant. Everything centers around this meal. This is the center of gravity for our faith. The entire Old Testament points forward to this moment. The entire New Testament points back to this moment, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This is the gospel. This is a meal that sets us apart. This is a meal that marks us. This is our family meal. This, this is one of the things that reminds us that we have a covenant with God because of what he's done for us. This is the good news of the gospel. We have a covenant with God because of what he's done for us, not because of what we can do for ourselves. And Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, was celebrating Passover with his disciples. And he said to them, I've longed to have this meal with you. Why this meal? He's had Passover with them before. Why is this night different than any other night? In fact, in the Jewish Passover, they actually say that. Why is tonight different than all other nights? And Jesus says, because you're going to understand how all of this has been pointing to this moment. They're about to realize that all these years of doing Passover, all of, the, all of it was pointing to and revealing Jesus. And he was going to now bring it all together for them in that, in that moment. As they celebrate Passover, they're remembering the four promises that God made to Israel, the promises of Passover. And in the typical Passover meal, that, those promises are remembered with four cups, or sometimes they'll have one cup and do it four times. And each one of those cups is tied to one of those four promises of Passover. I will bring you out from the yoke of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Those are the four promises. And they're remembered by those four cups. The cup of sanctification called out. The cup of deliverance. You've been delivered. The cup of redemption and the cup of fulfillment. And that's what Jesus is celebrating as he gathers and, and has this meal with his disciples. And that's what we remember. And Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. It wasn't just like they were around having dinner one night and uh, they're over at you know, some restaurant and, and Jesus grabbed it. Hey, let's take that loaf of bread and do something meaningful. And that extra cup of wine. They're remembering something very significant. And that's what we do. We enter back into that story every time we remember this. One famous rabbi said that every person should read the story of Passover as if he himself came out of Egypt. Well, how much more true is that for us as we remember the fulfillment of Passover? That's what we're going to do here tonight. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now, and then just a few moments we'll, we'll take the bread and the cup together. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that even when our hearts were against you and we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, in your mercy you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to live and to die as one of us, to take the burden of our sin and our sickness upon himself and to reconcile us to you once and for all. As we break bread together tonight, I pray that you would put us in remembrance of that sacrifice and give us a greater understanding of the covenant that we now have with you. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify this bread and this cup to be for us the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, and sanctify us also so that we may faithfully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, the Bible tells us that before we take this meal, that we should take time to examine our hearts, and we've been doing that tonight. And we've been led through several prayers of repentance, but I'm going to do that one more time. That's what tonight is all about. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession and a prayer of surrender before we actually take this meal together. We're going to admit right now we all sin. Nobody here is better than anybody else. We're all in a situation the same together. And we're going to confess our sin out loud to the Lord. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I just want to encourage you to just repeat after me, but you, you mean it in your own heart. Let's pray this. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you 
and my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. And Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now on the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread and when he gave thanks, he prayed a Hebrew prayer that Jewish people had been praying for thousands of years. When he gave thanks, he prayed, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'alam, hamotzi lecha min ha'eretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then he broke it. What an amazing sound. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Now listen, this wasn't just random bread. In a traditional Passover, there are three pieces of matzah. Traditionally, they stand for the mind of God, the word of God, and the, the spirit of God. That middle piece the mind of God is called the afikomen, and it means to come back later. And in the Passover, they take that, that middle piece of matzah and they break it and they put part of it in a linen and they hide it away. And it comes back later during the meal. And if there's a family with children, they'll let the little kids go find it. And the little kid that finds it and brings it back, he gets silver coins. I mean, you can see all of the symbolism in all of this. Jesus takes that, that middle piece, the Word. And who, and, and who was Jesus? He was the Word made flesh. And He says, this is my body given for you. Do this and remember to me. Let's take that now together. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup of wine. And again, He gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'alam, borei pri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Now, again, this just wasn't some random cup. This was the third cup of Passover. Remember, the third cup is the cup of redemption. The third promise is, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. And we know it was the third cup because in a Passover meal, they do the first cup and the second cup, and then they eat the meal. And then after they eat the meal, they do the third cup. And the Bible says, after supper, he took the cup of wine, the third cup, the third promise. And he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And hours later, they would see his arms outstretched upon the cross and the judgment of our sin placed upon him. And according to one gospel account, Jesus never drank the fourth cup, the cup of fulfillment. He says, I will not drink of the cup of the, the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in my father's kingdom. Because the fourth promise is, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. That promise is still being fulfilled. We're a part of that promise. We all drink the fourth cup with him together. Amen? Let's take this. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink this together. Now, the Bible teaches us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Would you please stand with me? What we're going to do right now is we're going to pray together a prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. If you're comfortable with it, I'd like you to, to join hands. If we're, we're a spiritual family here. We're one. And we're going to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sealing this moment in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is far. Chatter weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin that left a crimson stain. He died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin that left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless all of you. Now, thank you for coming tonight and being a part of this. Some say, well, what do I do now? Uh, uh, you have two options. One is to leave it on. Traditionally, Christians will leave it on just as a sign of humility as you're wandering around <laughs> on your way home. And others, wipe it off. <laughs> We're good with either one. Anyway, God bless you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.